<clears throat> Some Reflections on Separatism and Power from the Politics of Reality, Essays in Feminist Theory by Marilyn Fry. A note. This paper was first presented at a meeting of the Society for Women in Philosophy, Eastern Division, in December of 1977. It was first printed in Sinister Wisdom 6, summer of 1978. It is also available as a pamphlet from T. Rose Press, P.O. Box in, in Lansing, Michigan. Before it was published, I received many helpful comments from those who heard or read the paper. I have incorporated some, made notes of others. I got help from Carolyn Schaefer in seeing the structure of it all, in particular, in the connections among parasitism, access, and definition. I have been trying to write something about separatism almost since my first drawing of feminist consciousness, but it has always been, for me, somehow a mercurial topic, which, when I tried to grasp it, would softly shatter into many other topics like sexuality, man-hating, so-called reverse discrimination, apocalyptic, apocalyptic utopianism, and so on. What I have to share with you today is my latest attempt to get to the heart of the matter. In my life, and within feminism as I understand it, separatism is not a theory or a doctrine, nor a demand for certain specific behaviors on the part of feminists, though it is undeniably connected with lesbianism. Feminism seems to me to be a kaleidoscope, something whose shape, structures, and patterns alter with every turn of feminist creativity. And one element which is present through all the changes in the elements of of separation. This element has different roles and relations in different turns of the glass. It assumes different meanings, is variously conspicuous, variously determined or determining, depending on how the pieces fall and who is the beholder. The The theme of separation is its multitude variations, is in everything from divorce to exclusive lesbian separatism communities, from shelters for battered women to witch programs to women's bars, from ex- expansion of data. The presence of this theme is vigorously obscured, mystified, and outright denied by many feminist apologists who seem to find it embarrassing, while it is embraced, explored, expanded, and ramified by most of the more inspiring theorists and activists. The theme of separation is noticeably absent or heavily qualified in most of the things I take to be personal solutions and band-aid projects like legalization of prostitution, liberal marriage contracts, improvements of the treatment of rape victims, and affirmative action. It is clear to me, in my own case at least, that the the contrariety of assimilation and the separation is one of the main things that guides or determines assessments of various theories, actions, and practices as reformist or radical, as going to the root of the thing or being relatively superficial. So my topical question comes to this. What is it about separatism in any or all of its many forms and degrees that makes it so basic and so sinister, so exciting and so repellent? Feminist separation is, of course, separation of various sorts or modes from men, sorry, sorts or modes from men, and from institutions, relationships, roles, and activities which are male-defined, male-dominated, and operating for the benefit of males and the maintenance of male privilege, with this separation being initiated or maintained at will by women. Masculist separatism is the partial segregation of women from men and male domains at the will of men. This difference is crucial. The feminist separation can take many forms. Breaking up or avoiding close relationships or working relationships. Forbidding someone to enter your house. Excluding someone from your company. 
or from your meeting, withdrawing from participation in some activity or institution, or avoidance of participation, avoidance of communication and influence from certain quarters, not listening to music with sexist lyrics, not watching TV, withholding commitment or support, rejection of or rudeness towards obnoxious individuals. Some separations are subtle realignments of identifications, priorities and commitments, or working with agendas, which only incidentally coincide with the agendas of the institution one works with. Ceasing to be loyal to something or someone is a separation, a ceasing of love. The feminist separations are rarely, if ever, sought or maintained directly as ultimate personal or political ends. The closet we came, the closest we came to that, I think, is the separation which is the instinctive and self-preserving recoil from this systemic misogyny that surrounds us. Generally, the separations are brought about and maintained for the sake of something else, like independence, liberty, growth, invention, sisterhood, safety, health, or the practice of novel or heretical customs. Often the separations in question evolve unpremeditated as one goes one's way and finds various persons, institutions, or relationships useless, obstructive, or noisome and leaves them aside or behind. Sometimes the separate separations are consciously planned and cultivated as necessarily prerequisites as necessary prerequisites or conditions for getting on with one's business. Sometimes the separations are accomplished or maintained easily or with a sense of relief or even joy. Sometimes they are accomplished or maintained with difficulty by dint of custom constant vigilant vigilance or with anxiety, pain and grief. Most feminists, probably all, practice some separation from males and male-dominated institutions. A separatist practices separation consciously, systematically, and probably more generally than the others, and advocates throughout and through and quote-unquote broad-spectrum separatism as part of the conscious strategy of liberation. And, contrary to the image of the separatist as a cowardly escapist, Hers is the life and program which inspires the greatest hostility, disparagement, insult, and confrontation, and generally, she is the one against whom economic sanctions operate most conclusively. The penalty for refusing to work with or for men is usually starvation, or at the very least, doing without medical insurance. And if one's policy of non-cooperation is more subtle, one's livelihood is still constantly on the line, since one is not a loyal partisan, a proper member of the team, or what have you. <clears throat> the penalties for being a lesbian are ostracism, harassment, and job insecurity or joblessness. The penalty for rejecting men's sexual advances is often rape and perhaps even more often forfeit of such things as professional or job opportunities. And the separatist lives with the added burden of being assumed by many to be a morally depraved, man-hating bigot. But there is a clue here. If you are doing something that is so strictly forbidden by the patriarchs, you must be doing something right. There is an idea floating around in both feminist and anti-feminist literature to the effect that females and males generally live in a relationship of parasitism, a parasitism of the male on the female. That is, generally speaking, the strength, energy, inspiration, and nurturance of women that keeps men going and not the strength, aggression, spirituality, and hunting of men that keeps women going. It is sometimes said that parasitism goes the other way around, that the female is the parasite. But one can conjure the appearance of the female parasite only if one takes a very narrow view of human living. Historically parochial, narrow with respect to class and race, limited in conception of what the necessary are of what the necessary goods. Generally, the female contribution to her part material support is, and always has been, substantial. In many times and places, it has been independently sufficient. One can and should distinguish between a partial and contingent material dependence created by a certain sort of money, economy, and class structure, and the nearly ubiquitous spiritual, emotional, material dependence of males on females. 
Males presently provide, off and on, a portion of the material support of women within circumstances apparently designed to make it difficult for women to provide them for themselves. But females provide and generally have provided for males the energy and spirit for living. The males are nurtured by the females, and this the males apparently cannot do for themselves, even partially. <clears throat> The parasitism of males on females is, as I see it, demonstrated by the panic, rage, and hysteria generated in so many of them by the thought of being abandoned by women. But it is demonstrated in a way that is perhaps more generally persuasive by both literary and sociological evidence. Evidence cited in Jesse Bernard's work, The Future of Marriage, and in George Gilder's Sexual Suicide and Men Alone, convincingly show that males tend in shockingly significant numbers and in alarming degree to fall into mental illness, petty crime, alcoholism, physical infirmity, chronic unemployment, drug addiction, and neurosis when deprived of the care and companionship of a female mate or keeper. While on the other hand, women without male mates are significantly healthier and happier than women with male mates. And masculist literature is abundant with indications of male cannibalism, of males deriving essential substances from females. Cannibalistic imagery, visual and verbal, is common in pornography. Images likening women to food and sex to eating, and is documented in Millet's sexual politics and many other feminist analyses of masculist literature. The theme of men getting high off beating, raping, or killing women, or merely bullying them, is common. These interactions with women, or rather, these actions upon women, Make men feel good, walk tall, feel refreshed, invigorated. Men are drained and depleted by their living by themselves, and with and among other men, and are revived and refreshed, recreated, by going home and being served dinner, changing to clean clothes, having sex with the wife, or by dropping by the apartment of a woman friend to be served coffee and a drink and stroked in one way or another, or by picking up a prostitute for a quickie or for a dip in a favorite sexual escape fantasy or for raping refugees from their wars, foreign and domestic. The ministrations of women, by the willing, be they willing or unwilling, free or paid for, are what restore men the strength, will, and confidence to go on with what they call living. If it is true that, fundamental as that a fundamental aspect of the relationship between the sexes is male parasitism, it might help to explain why certain issues are particularly exciting to patriarchal loyalists. For instance, in view of the obvious advantages of easy abortion to population control, to control of welfare roles, and to ensuring sexual availability of women to men, it is, little, it is a little surprising that loyalists are so adamant and riled up in their objection to it. But look, <clears throat> the fetus lives parasitically. It is a distinct animal surviving off the life the blood of another animal creature. It is incapable of surviving on its own resources of independent nutrition, incapable of symbiosis. If it is true that males live parasitically upon females, it seems reasonable to suppose that many of them and those loyal to them are in some way sensitive to the parallelism between their situation and that of the fetus. They could easily identify with the fetus. The woman who is free to see the fetus as a parasite might be free to see the man as a parasite. The woman's willingness to cut off the lifeline to one parasite suggests a willingness to cut off the lifeline to another parasite. The woman who is capable, legally, psychologically, physically, of, de of decisively, self-interestedly, independently rejecting the one parasite is capable of rejecting, with the same decisiveness and independence, the like burden of the other parasite. In the eyes of the other parasite, the image of the wholly self-determined abortion involving not even a ritual submission to male veto power is the mirror image of death. Another clue here is that one line of argument against free and easy abortion is the slippery slope argument that if fetuses are to be freely dispensed with, old people will be next. Old people? Why are old people next? And why are the great concern for them? Most old people are women, indeed and patriarchal loyalists are not generally so solicitous of the welfare of any woman. Why old people? Because I think, in the modern patriarchal divisions of labor, old people too are parasites on women. 
The anti-abortion folks seem not to worry about the wife beating and the wife murder. There is no broad or emotional popular support for stopping these violences. They do not worry about murder and involuntary sterilization in prisons, nor murder in war, nor murder by pollution and industrial accidents. Either these are not real to them, or they cannot identify with the victims. But anyway, killing in general is not what they oppose. They worry about the rejection by women at women's discretion of something which lives parasitically on women. I suspect that they fret not because old people are next, but because the men are next. There are other reasons, of course, why patriarchal loyalists should be disturbed about abortion on demand, a major one being that it would be significant, a significant form of female control of reproduction, and at least from certain angles, it looks like the progress of patriarchy is the progress towards male control of reproduction, starting with possession of wives and continuing through the invention of obstetrics obstia and the technology of extrauterine gestation. Giving up that control would be giving up patriarchy, but such an objection to abortion is too abstract and requires too historical a vision to generate the hysteria there is now in the reaction against abortion. The hysteria is, I think, to be accounted for more in terms of a much more immediate and personal present time presentment of ejection by the woman womb. I discuss abortion here because it seems to me to be the most publicly emotional and most physically dramatic grounds on which the theme of separation and male parasitism is presently being played out. But there are other locales for this play. For instance, women with newly raised consciousnesses tend to leave marriages and families either completely through divorce or partially through unavailability of their cooking, housekeeping, and sexual services. And women academics tend to become alienated from their colleagues and male mentors and no longer serve as sounding board, ego booster, editor, mistress, or proofreader. Many awakening women become celibate or lesbian, and the others become a very great deal more choosy about when, where, and in what relationships they will have sex with men. And the men affected by these separations generally react with defensive hostility, anxiety, and guilt tripping, not to mention decent descents into illogical arguments which match and exceed their own most fanciful images of female irrationality. My claim is that they are very afraid because they depend on they depend very heavily upon the goods they receive from women, and these separations cut them off from those goods. Male separatism means that males must have access to women. It is the patriarchal imperative. Most feminists, no saying, is more than a substantial removal, redirection, reallocation of goods and services because access is one of the faces of power. Female denial of male access to females substantially cuts off a flow of benefits, but it also, but it has also the form and full potent, portent of assumption of power. Differences of power are always manifested in asymmetrical access. The President of the United States has access to almost everybody for almost anything he might want them, and almost nobody has access to him. The super rich have access to almost everybody, almost nobody has access to them. The resources of the employee are available to the boss as the resources of the boss are not to the employee. The parent has unconditional access to the child's room. The child does not have similar access to the parent's room. Students adjust to professor's office hours. Professors do not adjust to the student's conference hours. The child is required not to lie. The parent is free to close out the child with lies at her discretion. The slave is unconditionally accessible to the master. Total power is unconditional access. Total powerlessness is being unconditionally accessible. The creation and manipulation of power is con is constituted of is constituted of the manipulation and control of access all women's group all women groups meetings projects seem to be great things for causing controversy 
and confrontation. Many women are offended by them. Many are afraid to be the one to announce the exclusion of men. It is seen as a device whose use needs must elaborate justification. I think this is because conscious and deliberate exclusion of men by women from anything is blatant insubordination and generates in women fear of punishment and reprisal, fear which is often well justified. Our own timidity and desire to avoid confrontation generally keeps us from doing very much in the way of all women groups and meetings. But when we do, we invariably run into the male champion who challenges our right to do it. Only a small minority of men go crazy when an event is advertised to be for women only. Just one man tried to crash our women only rape speak out and only a few hid under the auditorium seats to try to spy on women-only meeting at a now convention in Philadelphia. But these few are onto something their less rabid, calm patriots are missing. The women-only meeting is a fundamental challenge to the structure of power. It is always the privilege of the master to enter the slave's hut. The slave who decides to exclude the master from her hut is declaring herself not a slave. The exclusion of men from the meeting not only deprives them of certain benefits which they might survive without, it is a controlling of access, hence an assumption of power. It is not only mean, it is arrogant. It becomes clearer now why there is always an off-putting aura of negativity about separatism, one which offends the feminine Pollyanna in us and smacks of purely defensive to the political theorist in us. It is this. First, when those who control access have made you totally accessible, your first act of taking control must be denying access or must access or must have denial of access as one of its aspects. This is not because you are charged up with unfeminine or politically incorrect negativity. It is because of the logic of the situation. When we start from a position of total accessibility, there must be an aspect of no saying, which is the beginning of control in the every, in every effective act and strategy, the effective one being precisely those which shift power, i.e. ones which involve manipulation and control of access. Second, whether or not one says, quote unquote, no, or withholds or closes, are, closes out or rejects, on this occasion or that, the capacity and ability to say quote-unquote no with effect is logically necessary to control. When we are in control of access to ourselves, there will be some no saying, and when we are more accustomed to it, when it is more common, an ordinary part of living, it will not seem so prominent, obvious, or strained. We will not strike ourselves or others as being particularly negative. It is this aspect of ourselves and our lives in this aspect of ourselves and our lives, we will strike ourselves pleasingly as active beings with momentum of our own, with sufficient shape and structure, with sufficient integrity to generate friction. Our experience of, of our no saying will be an aspect of our experience of our definition. When our feminist acts or practices have an aspect of separation, we are assuming power by controlling access and simultaneously by undertaking definition. The slave who excludes the master from her hut thereby declares herself not a slave. A definition is another face of power. The powerful normally determine what is said and sayable. When the powerful label something or dub it or baptize it, the thing becomes what they call it. When the Secretary of Defense calls something a peace negotiation, for instance, then whatever it is that he called a peace negotiation is an instance of negotiating peace. If the activity in question is working out the terms of a trade-off of nuclear reactors and territorial redistributions, complete with arrangements for resulting refugees, that is peacekeeping, peacemaking. People laud it, and the negotiators get 
Nobel prizes for it. On the other hand, when I call a certain speech act a rape, my quote unquote calling it does not make it so. At best, I have to explain and justify and make clear exactly what it is about the speech act, which is assaultive in just what way. And then the other others acquiesce in saying the act was like rape or could figuratively be called rape. My counter assault will not be counted as, sim- as a simple case of self-defense. And when I called rejection of parasitism, they call the loss of the womanly virtues of compassion and quote unquote caring. And generally, when renegade women call something one thing and patriarchal loyalists call it another, the loyalists get their way. Women generally are not the people who do the defining and we cannot form our isolation and powerlessness simply commence saying different things than others say and make it stick. There is a Humpty Dumpty problem in that, but we are able to arrogate definitions, to arrogate define definition to ourselves when we repattern access. Assuming control of access, we draw new boundaries and create new roles and relationships. This, though it causes some strain, puzzlement and hostility, is to a fair extent within the scope of individuals and small gangs, as outright verbal redefinition is not, at least in the first instance. One may say access as coming may see access as coming in two sorts, quote unquote natural and humanly arranged. A grizzly bear has what you might call natural access to the picnic blanket of the unarmed human. The access of the boss to the personnel personal service of the secretary is humanely arranged, humanly arranged access. The boss exercises institutional power. It looks to me, looking from a certain angle, like institutions are humanly designed pattern, patterns of access, access to persons and their services. But institutions are artifacts of definition. In the case of in intentionally and formally designed institutions, this is very clear, for the relevant definitions are explicitly set forth by laws and constitutions, regulations, and rules. When one defines the term quote-unquote president, one defines president in terms of what they can do and what is owed them by other offices, and quote-unquote what they do is a matter of their access to the services of others. Similarly, Definitions of dean, student, judge, and cop set forth patterns of access, and definitions of writer, child, owner, and of course, husband, wife, and man and girl. When one changes the pattern of access, one forces new use of words, uses of words on those affected. The term man has to shift in meaning when rape is no longer possible. The term When we take control of sexual access to us, of access to our nurturance and to our reproductive function, access to mothering and sistering, we redefine the word woman. The shift of usage is pressed on others by a change in social reality. It does not wait their renegotiation, their recognition of our definitional authority. When women separate, withdraw, break out, regroup, transcend, stove aside, shove aside, step outside, migrate, say no. We are simultaneously controlling access and defining. We are doubly insubordinate, since neither of these is permitted, and access and definition are fundamental ingredients in the alchemy of power, so we are doubly and radically insubordinate. If these, then, are some of the ways in which separation is at the heart of our struggle, it helps to explain why separation is such a hot topic. If there is one thing women are queasy about, it is actually taking power. As long as one stops just short of that, the patriarchs will for the most part take an indulgent attitude. We are afraid of what will happen to us when we really frighten them. This is not an irrational fear. It is our experience in the movement generally that the defensiveness, nastiness, violence, hostility, and irrationality of, of their reaction to feminism tends to correlate with the blatancy of the element of separation in the strategy or project which triggers the action. 
The separations involved in women leaving homes, marriages, and boyfriends, separations from fetuses, and separation of lesbianism are all pretty dramatic. That is, they are dramatic and blatant when perceived from within the framework provided by patriarchal worldview and male parasitism. Matters pertaining to marriage and divorce, lesbianism and abortion touch individual men and their sympathizers because they can feel the relevance of, the, of these to themselves. They can feel the threat that they might be next. Hence, heterosexuality, marriage, and motherhood, which are the institutions which most obviously and individually maintain female accessibility to males, form the core triad of anti-feminist ideology. And all women spaces, all women organizations, all women meetings, all women classes are outlawed, suppressed, harassed, ridiculed, and punished. In the name of that other fine and enduring patriarchal institution, sex equality. To some of us, these issues can seem almost foreign, strange ones to be occupying center stage. We are busily engaged <clears throat> in what seem to us our blanket insubordination, living our own lives, taking care of ourselves and one another, doing our work, and in particular, telling it as we see it. Still, the original sin in the separation which these presuppose, and it is that, not our art or philosophy, not our speech making, nor our quote unquote sexual acts or abstinences for which we will be persecuted when worst comes to worst. <laughs>